So here's the full graphic that we remember from before the full process. I'm just going to kind of walk through up to where we are. So we've received the manuscript from the author. Um, we composed it after kind of getting a look at what elements are in it. Maybe that involves having a discussion with the author and identifying, hey, maybe this looks like we need some learning goals. Oh, author two, if you're working in a multi-author book, you know, we're repeating a section in every chapter and I don't see it in yours. So you have that discussion with the author, identify elements, compose it, and then it gets refined in the hub. If you remember from composing, we do broad stroke and then let the refiner on the hub handle things like first, last, standalone. It gets edited according to your internal methods or according to a certain style guideline. And then we end up with a final manuscript where everything is done. At that point, what we're going to do today, we're going to have a brief discussion about um, some considerations to make for your design. Um, we'll walk through using the hub to uh, vet the file from a different standpoint. Now we're not looking for, to just identify elements. We're thinking about identifying things in the manuscript and maybe making note of some changes that the designer will have to make or some potential issues that we want to alert the designer to. We'll make what's called an IDTT file. Um, that is a file we're not going to really open or touch. We're just going to use it to uh, flow text into InDesign. Um, I'll touch briefly when we get to that point about some advantages uh, for using the IDTT because, of course, you could copy and paste into InDesign. You could drag your Word document into InDesign. But we have this tool that we've developed that has a lot of advantages. And then we'll talk about typesetting. We're going to look at parts of the book um, so that everyone has a sort of solid base. I know there's a lot of different experiences here, but we'll identify some common elements that we want to see in textbooks, which should relate back to Dave Burns' talk, which unfortunately I missed, but I did see a very thorough module. So I was referring to that for this. As I mentioned before, we want to have InDesign. Oh, yeah, that's right. And I'll touch briefly about this. Kathy's clapping because we took the sample document that she provided us with for our talk on composition and used this for the design sample. It's purely for as an example. So I don't expect this to, you know, become anything, but uh, you'll see, Kathy, there's also a couple things I added just as placeholder elements. All right, so we're at the point now where we're going to start designing and composing things. One thing that we want to make sure is that there's no major content or structure changes. Uh, at this point, if you're the project manager, maybe you're designing while you're editing, but you would want to make sure that there's no major structural changes that are going to happen, by which I mean you're not going to suddenly say, oh, you know, we're editing it and we realize that we're going to change all the beheads to sidebars, or if we're editing it and we realize that something was composed incorrectly. That's where that composition QC comes through, that stage before composition, or that stage between composition and editing that's going to identify different structures. And maybe that's when you have a discussion, like we mentioned briefly before, where we saw that there were learning goals and objectives at the beginning of the chapter. And we could have a discussion about making sure that those weren't regular text, but rather treated as this new, I could almost consider it like meta content. That's content about the content in a, in a book like this. Uh, you also want to be mindful of while you're working on your manuscript and plan ahead while composing, kind of like what we said. So again, reiterating, all the elements are in place. There's not something, um, when I say all the elements are in place, we will make sure that everything is accounted for while doing your design. If you know that maybe you're working on a multi-author book and one person is handling an appendix and there maybe there's a strange structure to the appendix, it's a rubric, or maybe you're working on something for the teacher, like a, uh, like a curriculum map. That's the kind of thing that we want in place because we want the designer to be able to account for all these things. So there's a little bit of corralling that needs to happen. We want to be mindful of all the different aspects of the book at this stage. Um, you know, the main thing that we're talking about is moving from pre-production to production, we're moving from electronic to print. So when I say we want to make sure everything's in place, it's because now all of a sudden it can be kind of a big problem to introduce new elements. Uh, it's, it's very easy at this stage for maybe you're missing some content in editing. The author can give it to you. You can put it into your Word document, and it's no big deal. Now you just have a little bit more content that you have to edit. When we get into production, 
now we're suddenly looking at page numbers and we're looking at uh, what's what's called reflow. Um, does anyone have any idea about what we mean by reflow at this stage? Yes, reflow mm -hmm. is, is a cause for suicide. <laughs> yeah. Now, reflow means simply pushing one set of elements that are behind a change onto a next page. So you may end up with, instead of every, instead of headings showing up at the top of a page, for instance, you might end up with uh, a text that's moved from one page onto the next page. It, it throws off a design the visual balance usually. Yeah. I'll give you another nightmare scenario for reflow and why we want to make sure that when the editing process is complete, we have all the content for the book. Let's say you have completed the first proof of your book and you've handed it off to an editor and all of a sudden author, author one comes back and says, Oh, you know what? I forgot. I, whoops. I, you know, didn't give you that learning objective I was supposed to give you about and everyone forgot about it. All of a sudden page one, has now moved and perhaps everything else moves along with it and your index is wrong. That can happen at any stage. We've had that before where, you know, a client kind of knowing this says, um, hey, we want to add a new section and this is going to be the new page one. Well, now our index book is totally wrong. And Carla, you wanted to add something? Yeah, um, I will admit that this is enough to like make you want to fling yourself off something very high. Um, and I know with my journal, and I know journals are different than books, again, setting clear expectations. Once something has gone into layout, um, we tell our authors, if we have screwed up something as a result of layout, we have left something out or something got cut out, we will make that change. But once it goes into layout, you cannot add in new paragraphs, you cannot go in and make substantial changes because it ends up being such a nightmare and so time consuming to reformat it. So I, I would just say, when you're thinking about how you want to communicate with your authors, again, setting this expectation that you can't add in 57 new paragraphs once you get this back, or at least that's my recommendation. We learned that pretty on with pretty early on with my journal. Yeah, yeah. When I was when I was back in the 90s, as we were doing this, this particular book, Applied Statistics, the you know, authors came up and said, "Well, we found this great map in the middle of it. We want to add." And of course, it wasn't in the manuscript, it wasn't in any of the plans, and it threw all the page count off by two through half the book, so it happened. Yeah. So you, there are times when you absolutely have to learn to tell an author, no, we'll mm -hmm. do it in another edition, we'll do it in another printing, we'll do it in something else, but no, we're, we're, too, we're too far down the road for this one. Yeah, and you can have a discussion with them about, you know, we're gonna, this is gonna cause extra charges, maybe the author is responsible for those charges, that's, that's happened in the past. But absolutely, Carla and Richard, you're right, being very clear. And that's something in our form letters, too, that say, this is your last chance, or here's your first proof PDF. There's no rewriting that's happening. There's like small corrections that happen. Um, so that's why it's very important, like Karen reiterated, to have everything as set as possible. Um, so now we want to communicate with our designer. We have our finished manuscript, and we're going to kind of talk to our, author, our designer about what we want in the book. That could be for your demographic. Um, when I say for your demographic, we talk, talk about like, how's the book gonna look? What audience is it gonna refer to? Um, I feel like I maybe went a little young with this example document. Everything's kind of like bright and colorful. That might be something that you like in your design, but maybe you want it to be just like a little bit more serious. That's fine. That's just something I would communicate to your designer. Um, that could relate to the level of complexity of the book as well. Um, if we have a sort of simple book, then it might be fine to make things kind of bright, big, um, accessible, approachable. But if you're working on something like an algebra textbook or something really um, maybe it's super scientific, then we want to dial it back a little bit. But it's up to you as to what tone the book is going to have. Um, I would warn the designer about any issues you encountered uh, that could be, relate to missing images. It's kind of okay to have some missing images at this point because we can do something called FPO images. Uh, that means for placement only. The designer can maybe use boxes, things like that to push text around. But if you're missing anything, we just want to make sure that that's communicated to the designer. And then um, we also want to talk about what the author's role is. This gets a little complicated, especially if you're working with an author who is in love with their book and has been very hands-on throughout the entire process. You guys 
as the PM and essentially the press managers, it's up to you to decide how much you want the author's input at this stage. We have other clients who work with the author and send it to them for a review and get their take on it. Other clients just say, this is not your responsibility. This is the press's responsibility. Sometimes they might even have a template. Other clients have templates that they use for certain books. So they might have a series that fits into the template. It's not really up to the author at that point. And it's not part of the author's responsibility to give any design input when that's the case. Uh, that could be somewhat of a difficult discussion, especially if the author maybe has had some expectations about it. Um, we've even had uh, an, an author make their book really nice in, in Microsoft Word and the press provided us with a design where we said this is the author. They had a very bad reaction and said they worked very hard and they think that Times New Roman is the best possible font to use. And they had to have a discussion with the authors to say like, this is, you know, it wasn't up to our standards. That's not what we're doing. Our goal is not to make a nice Word document. We're trying to go to shoot a little bit higher. Yes, go ahead, Carl. Um, so, I know with my journal, we've kind of struggled with some of the things that you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think it comes down to communication and final decisions. In the end, we give the author an opportunity to review the final layout version. Um, mm -hmm. Number one, because an extra set of eyes never hurts, but number two, sure. we kind of do it, and I know this sounds awful saying it this way, but it's almost self-protection for the journal and that us having them sign off on the last layout version, that way later, if a mistake is found, um, certainly we as a journal will work to correct that mistake. But um, it, it, it's one thing if the authors looked it over and approved the final version and that gets published and then the mistake is spotted later, as versus we published it without them giving a final review and then a mistake is spotted later. Um, but mm -hmm. that said, I'm talking about journal articles, which are at a max, you know, 30 to 35 pages long as versus a book. So it's a hard decision either way. Um, there are pros and cons. We have had some authors who come back and nitpick every little thing. And um, like you said, getting to the point where you tell them this is standard layout, this is how we structure things. No, we're not, we're not changing something based off personal preference. Um, so there's pros and cons both ways. Mm -hmm. And it also comes into defining your internal standards. Like for example, Scribe has internal typesetting standards that relate to how will we hyphenate text, how will we justify text, what our sort of uh, minimum requirements are for how many lines are on a page, things like that. That if you have these rules in place early on, it's really helpful. We've, we've encountered authors who think that you know, hyphenation is bad and they think that hyphens like disrupt reading, things like that. Um, and they can really kind of derail the whole project if they start getting a little bit of control and then this sounds more adversarial than it actually is um, but you know they can really kind of take control once you give a little bit all of a sudden they're in charge and they're it's their book and now it's their design and you might disagree with them it might not look that good so that's why we always think just strong rules so you can go back to the author and point to well, these are our internal standards and this is the what everything is going to fall under so you may not like hyphens but I'm sorry, that's our internal standard. That's how we balance text. Are there any questions about kind of author management or internal guidelines, things like that? No. Okay. One, one um, comment yeah. before we go on. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I, I had to kind of learn um, as a project manager in like 1992 was that there really are no enemies in this. Everybody's doing their best. It's just they may have different understanding. And when you, when you approach it like that, there, it's very unusual when you get a genuine adversarial relation. I've had one. It's that book I just showed you. But, um, but the rest of them, the rest, authors are normally rational people. Um, and they're normally very busy. And sometimes you can couch it in, you know, we're doing this to save you work or time or effort so that you can concentrate on other things. And most people will get along with that. Yeah, it's a very good point. I'm sorry if I, I sort of think about possible pitfalls and how they relate to in this relationship, but that's where I think it sounds a little worse than it actually is. As you said, 99% of the people that we deal with, perfectly fine and no issues there. 